is not just for your devs, or a better title might be how to show love to your community organizers. So my name is Maureen McElhaney. I am here from Vermont, so in case you don't know where Vermont is, uh, that's where it is all the way up the top. It's pretty much almost in Canada. And sometimes when I go hiking, my phone <coughs> overwhelms because it thinks I'm in Canada, so that's how close we are to the border. Um, and I uh, also am a community organizer. I have been um, organizing communities for about five years, and I've, uh, the vast majority of this work was not paid. So I have organized quite a few conferences, the UX Burlington, Burlington Ruby, and Offline Camp, as well as I founded my local chapter of Girl Velvet, which is a nonprofit that teaches women how to code, and we're celebrating four years this year. Um, I realized I wasn't looking at my speaker notes, so I'm going to go back two slides real quick because I wanted to also talk about who this talk is for. Um, so this talk is really for people who work at companies that need to hire developers or uh, want to make a case uh, to your company about why they, you should have more opportunity to support your community. Um, also for people who attend tech events, which is all of us in this room, um, but you aren't sure you know, how or why you should help. Uh, organized community, uh, people who organize tech community stuff and want to better articulate what kinds of things you need and what kinds of things you can get help with, and you know, but you're not quite sure how to ask. So back to building communities and organizing communities. Uh, this work really didn't come easily. You know, I've been doing it for five years. I've been involved in a lot of different projects, and you know, when you're organizing communities, there's a lot of back and forth. Have a lot of volunteers and people who really have, uh, you know, they're very well meaning, but they're not offering help that is super helpful. Like they want, you, want to meet you for coffee and then they ask you a bunch of questions and they say all these things they're going to do and then you don't hear from them for three or four or five months or ever. And so you wasted a bunch of time talking to them and they didn't really have, uh, you know, your best interest in heart. And so, you know, Girl Development is a good example of this for me. So we're celebrating four years. It wouldn't be possible to do this work if we didn't have amazing supporters in our community, companies that provide space for us to hold our classes, volunteers who come to TA for us, people to teach our classes. I have a co-leader who joined me a few years ago. I have a team of volunteers that help organize. So without all of this support, you know, Girl Development wouldn't have lasted four years. We wouldn't have grown to over a thousand members. And then we're part of a network of 54 chapters across the country and 70 mem 70,000 members in, in that network. So all of this wouldn't be possible without just one person saying, hey, can I do this work for an hour, you know, once a month or something. So now I work for IBM. I'm a developer advocate for the Watson Data Platform. And for the first time, I'm actually getting paid to organize community. And so now I'm on the other side of the fence. I get to support community organizers, but I also work with people who support community <coughs> organizers. And I want to help people understand how they can do this better and more effectively, and do it in a way that makes it easier for communities to run and function and last a long time, and everyone's happy, and learns lots of awesome stuff. So in thinking about doing this, I've also, in my job, I got involved with the Offline First community, uh, if you haven't heard of it, Offline First is a method to software development where you handle first the issue of you know, how do your users interact with your app when they're offline. So you can do that with local databases and things like that, but there's a really budding, great budding community around this technology and they're really at the infant stages. So now I'm starting over with a new community that needs to grow from the ground up. Elixir is maybe similar to that. I think you're still growing. There's still a lot of evangelizing that needs to happen to pull people into this community. So maybe this will ring true for you. So in my experience building communities, not getting paid, now that I am getting paid and I'm helping to organize a community that's international, I wanted to know how much of my experience is universal. So I posed a question to Twitter. I said, you know, do you help organize community in, that, in tech? I'd like to talk to you and, and see what your experience is like. And I was really looking for people who had amazing supporters and made their work more easier, or e easier and more fulfilling. And I heard from people all around the world. I heard from North Carolina, Washington DC, Philadelphia, California, also Berlin, in the UK, around Europe. And I was surprised, well, maybe not that surprised, to hear that they all really share a lot of the same questions. 
illustrations. So my real, like the, the, if you take one goal away from this talk, my goal is to say you can't effectively support a tech community until you understand who they are and who they serve. And that way you can really benefit, you can find ways to benefit the community and then also find a way that you can also get mutual benefit from, from that relationship. So I want to help you understand, you know, uh, some different tactics around that. So let's define a little bit about the communities that we're talking about. Uh, you know, some of these groups might be tied directly to a company. The company might own uh, this community and fund it and, and they have sort of personal interests in being part of it. It could also be run by a nonprofit or volunteers. It could be run by people who are paid to organize community, but the community isn't necessarily attached to their company. It's just kind of advantageous for, in some way. And some communities are tied to the advanced of specific programming language, like Elixir, uh, or a development method. And others are committed to the advancement of diversity in tech or something like that. So in all my conversations, five major themes arose. Uh, listen, learn, and be straight up. Make it easy to request support. Be prepared to offer more than just cash. Think long term. And encourage your employees to participate. So we'll go through each one. Christine Schneider of DAT Project, CSS Conf EU, Upfront UG, and CSS Classes said, start a dialogue. Understand the community and be transparent about why your company wants to support it. So there are a lot of really great reasons to get involved with supporting your community as, as, as a company. Uh, you know, you're cre creating a valuable recruitment pipeline and marketing the existence and the culture of your company, and you're fostering avenues for continued learning and improvement of your workers. So people at your company are more likely to get involved with the community if you're getting involved with it too, and encouraging them to go. And you're also letting the folks in your city know that you care about the ecosystem of tech outside of your walls. And uh, so, you know, you have to bear in mind that not all the ways of supporting community are really going to help the mission of that community. So you have to kind of have a conversation and see, you know, what they really need. A really good example of this is Girl Development because our local chapters are run by volunteers. And so, our communities wouldn't be possible if we didn't have a really strong support network um, to make it possible. So I talked to Sylvia Pelcourt of GDI Raleigh, and she has a supporter, uh, they're a local company called Sync Fusion, and they, she said they're helpful to us on our community first and sell themselves second. The recruiting and sales pitches are there, but respectful and appropriate. So if you're a helpful partner that makes community really easy, or someone who's doing something awesome in tech, they will happily sing the praises of your company and you don't have to really do anything because you're just making their jobs easier. So let's talk a little bit about a guide uh, you know, to see what you need to know to identify a community to support and uh, find out what their needs are. So when you identify a community and you're really interested in learning more, you should sit down with the organizer and ask them some basic questions. You know, find out about their community. What's the demographic of people who attend? What's the socioeconomic status? Where are they travel in from to come to your events? How many people attend your events? What is the group's core mission or most pressing goal? And what are you trying to achieve with the work that you're doing in this community? Maybe what three concrete things does your group need the most right now to be able to achieve these goals? And why are you doing this work? I think a lot of times when we go to community events, uh, we just assume that the person is doing it because they have just the kindest heart and they care so much. But they might have some personal reasons too. Maybe they want to advance in their career. Maybe they want to demonstrate some more leadership skills. Maybe it's for the benefit of their company for some reason. And so it's important for you to know that. And those are good reasons to do community. But they're different. They're, they sort of differ in what people need. So, awesome. You had a great conversation, you learned a ton, you're super jazzed about the person who's leading this community, you have a lot of confidence that you know, this is going to last a long time and you want to jump in and make it better. But you should hold up a little bit because some communities are not really the place you might want to be and you should ask a few more questions before you jump into that. Um, and really, with a, with a tech company with some skin in the game, 
you probably want to know if this is a toxic community for some reason. You know, it, are they creating an inclusive space? Are people from marginalized groups made to feel welcome in this community? And conversely, you don't want to make the faux pas of supporting a community that turns around and you know, bites you in the butt a little bit. So, and what does a toxic community look like? So when you're looking at communities, uh, a toxic community might be a community that you, know, you look around, you go to an event, and all you see is you know, white males. And there aren't any women speaking. There haven't been any people of color who spoke in the past year or two. And that could be because they have a small network and they haven't found a way to reach out yet. It might be because these people are avoiding this community for very good reasons. And you probably want to know that before you throw any money or time or effort into that. A good example of this is LambdaConf. Uh, last year, they hired a keynote speaker who had ties to white supremacy. And the community went into an uproar because of this. And so activists from all around the country and around the world emailed LambdaConf and email the companies were supporting them, begging them to pull out. And within a few days, LambdaConf lost all but one of their sponsors for the conference. Now, without listing the names of the companies that pulled out from this support, you know, you don't want to be the one on the receiving end of those emails. You know, an onslaught of people who are angry that you are putting a tie in your, your name to, to this kind of stuff. So there are some really good questions you can ask to qualify and sort of get a feel for whether there might be some troubling things you need to know about. First you can ask, do you have a code of conduct and a diversity statement? Do you have a policy against teachers, organizers, speakers, presenters using sexualized images or activities or other material at your events? What strategies are you employing to ensure that your community promotes inclusion and diversity? And have a little bit of conversation about that, because if they've struggled with it, there may be some opportunity for them to improve, or maybe their answers sound a little bit suspect and you realize they don't actually care that much. What percentage of your speakers, say in the last 12 months, have represented a diverse group? And is there alcohol at your community events? And if so, do you have an alcohol policy? Do you make sure that there are non-alcoholic beverages available? Uh, do you offer options so that not all of your events are centered around alcohol? So these are all really good questions. By this point, you probably have a good feel that you want to support, they're doing a good job, they really care about their community and they want it to be inclusive. Now you should make it really easy for them to request support when they need it. Tasha Scott of .NET DC and Code Camp New York that if your company sells tech services, you should be sponsoring tech community events. Attendees of tech community events are more likely to be dedicated to their craft and have more well-rounded insights on how to solve problems for your company since they've seen how others solve problems. And sponsoring tech events also gives companies the potential to meet candidates face-to-face -face in a more natural environment. So there are a bunch of really great companies out there who do this really well. GitHub has an online portal where you can go and they really outline very clearly what they offer and what kinds of support they're able to give. They collect all your information and then they let you know if you, if you got sponsorship. Some other great companies out there, Heroku, Adobe, MailChimp, all do this as well. One benefit of this is that not only are you able to really state explicitly what kind of support you're able to offer, but your company at the end of the year gets to see exactly how much support, how much impact you had, how many developers were at the events that you support it, how many events, you know, in total, what was the money that was spent, and what was the return. And so you're able to really track that over time, and that was great for your marketing and your recruiting, you know, numbers. So outside of just money, there's a lot of things that are really important to community organizers, especially the volunteers. You know, if you're a volunteer and you're running a community, getting a bunch of money probably feels great, but it's a bunch of accounting, it's a lot of tracking, it's a, it's a lot of extra work, and sometimes people just don't have the capacity to deal with it. So being prepared to do more than just throw money at an event is key to a lot of success in the community. So if you can, in case you need some ideas of what to offer, snacks. Snacks are always great. Everybody loves snacks. Uh, but there's lots of other things you could offer space uh, for workshops or meetups. Uh, which includes table, like setting up tables and chairs, access to a projector, access to Wi-Fi. You could donate name tags to the group or power strips, uh, help pay for stickers or buttons, 
um, or offer loaner laptops if your company has some old laptops that you're throwing away. You check with your local Rural Belka chapter or some other nonprofit that needs this kind of stuff for their members to work for it. There are some more in-depth ways that you can get involved. So you could be the one to coordinate the logistical stuff for the venue. So if you're offering space, uh, set it all up for them, have someone at the door to let people in and direct. That way the person organizing the event doesn't have to worry about all that stuff. It's really kind of emotional labor, and all they have to do is worry about the content. You could also donate swag from your company. So you know, if your company makes t-shirts or stickers or you know, water bottles, whatever, Donate that to the group, they get to give it out for free, the members are happy because they get free stuff, and you're happy because your name is walking all over town now. Michael Rogers, who is the court community organizer at the Node.js Foundation, creator of NodeConf, and co-host of RSC Podcast, uh, said this after Offline Camp. So, uh, one really amazing thing about Offline Camp is that it's run by the Offline First community, it's not tied to any company, it's an international community of people from all over the world, coming from all different kinds of technical backgrounds. And at IBM, because we sort of found a way to help them because of our ties to IBM Cloud End and the way that database works offline, we can justify paying organizers to help organize this event. And because of that, there's a lot of work that goes into uh, Follow-up afterwards, we have a Medium account that we follow up with campers and ask them to just kind of blog about their experience. And we're able to do all this extra work because we're paid for it during the day. And that, you know, really well makes the community more well-rounded, creates a lot more documentation about what happened at our events. So if you didn't get to attend, you still get to learn about it. And that really, uh, you know, not only helps the community, but all the partic participants benefit from that too. So if you have the ability to give your employees maybe just some, like a volunteer day to go help organize, or a small percentage of their time to help organize community, it makes a huge impact. So next, really, you want to think long term. You really want to think outside of just one event. So you could sponsor one conference and make an impact to that one event for that one day or two days. But if you think about a community and you think about what you want to invest in it long term, if you think more in terms of months, years, it makes such a, such a much bigger impact and that community is able to plan a lot more in advance on what they're going to do in the future. Jan Leonard of Hoodie and Apache Couch TV said, the best thing companies can do to help communities and events is tax selfless and not look for an immediate return on investment. The return always comes, and usually with greater value than would have been achieved with strict ROI considerations. So to think more long term, you can certainly set a budget for sponsoring coffee or pizza or snacks at a user group every month for a year. Uh, you could set up dedicated space so that that group knows that they can use your space every month and maybe create even create an easy way for them to schedule their events there. You could provide corporate discounts, so if that community needs to fly in speakers from other places, offer to book the lodging and use your discount so that the group, you know, even if they pay you back, they get a discount and it, it helps their budget out. Or you could provide free or discounted access to your services to the group as well. The greatest gift you can give to any community organizer really is encouraging your employees to participate. Tasha Scott of .NET DC and Code Camp New York said, bonus points, consider attending the attendance of a tech community event as training hours and let your employees attend on work time. You'll be investing not only in the skill of your employees, but in their work-life balance as well, while keeping impact to the training budget low. So, you know, skilled and passionate technical, resource, uh, technical workers are a precious resource to your company. And there are endless reasons for you to encourage them to participate in the community. If you're tight on training dollars, giving them comp time or allowing them to come into work late, you know, the day after they go to a meetup, makes it so that not only will they get better at their job and continue to pursue their passions, but they also bring this uh, skill back to your company as well. So for people here, you know, there may be, so is there, I don't want you to raise your hands or anything, but I bet there's someone here in this audience who didn't tell their boss they're coming. 
because you might work for a company, and I, I wasn't able to get anybody on the record to say this, but you might work for a company that thinks because you're going to a tech event that you're trying to find a new job, you're going to leave them. And may or may, that may or may not be true, but you uh, had to use personal time to be here today. Because it's Friday, you had to use a vacation day. You're investing in yourself by being here. And your community will give back to you for that investment, um, even if your boss won't. So Lorna Mitchell of PHP Northwest Conf, and also a wonderful author and public speaker, said, I tell, tend to tell people that the community will help them scale up and also make the connections for their next step. So for you, this could mean following your passions on the evenings or weekends or taking vacation time to do it. And with family commitments and non-technical passions, this privilege of extra time isn't available to everyone. But if you have the time and ability, there will be a payoff, I promise you. So you know, stay in touch with the people you meet at this event, if that is you, if you identify with that. Rob Hale uh, of HackBT and Vermont Code Camp said, don't ask permission. Your employer is really not paying for your free time, basically. Uh, so if you're hes getting hesitation from your managers, just don't tell them go anyway, because you're really learning new things that will make you a better developer and a better technologist and a better member of your community. Rob also said, I'm way more interested in building a healthy, supportive community than meeting the needs of any one employer. So if you're a team leader or a manager, here today, uh, you know, let the people on your team do these things. Encourage the other parts of your company. You know, maybe you're an awesome manager and you brought some of your team here today, but you know someone else in your engineering organization who isn't quite so open to that, and those people under them suffer. You know, they're going to do it anyway, so your company might as well benefit from it. So you can offer comp time, but you can also ask them to report back about what they learned. So if you can only afford to send one or two people to a conference in a year, uh, you can ask them to host a recap session or write a blog post for your engineering blog um, or host a viewing party, especially if a conference as awesome as Elixir Days has videos that come out afterwards. So host a few viewing parties of content that was really relevant to your engineering team and then have a discussion about it afterwards. Uh, or maybe ask them to give a training on a skill that they learned. So not only do they get to benefit from learning these things and bringing them back, and organizing their learning, but your team as a whole gets to benefit from all this work too. So in closing, in all truth, this talk is a selfish one for me. Uh, I've been, like I said, I've been organizing community for many years, and I had a lot of really crazy personal things that happened last year that caused me to burn out. I quit everything for about four months. I stopped doing Girl Velvet, I stopped going to meetups. I really just kind of focused on my family and myself. And in that time, you know, at first I thought, you know, I'm not going back. I don't know why I'm doing this anymore. This is just, you know, a horrible, uh, uh, you know, drain on my time. And after, like, a few weeks and a couple months, I got to really hone in on why I was passionate about this work and what about it is, is so wonderful. Because getting to see people learn new things is, is just so intoxicating, and I, and I have to keep doing it. But I had to really rein in what I offer and be more respectful of my time, and be better about asking people for this help. So organizing this talk for me was really organizing those thoughts and sharing them outside. But I really think that every successful community organizer needs a break every now and then. It's important for you to take a break and really uh, rein in on why you're doing this and, and what you want to be doing. And that person also deserves to be part of a community that will step in and pick it up for them so the community doesn't, doesn't die when they need to take a break. So, you know, like I said, as community organizers, we're passionate, we love people in our, own, in, our, in our own special ways, and we have a really hard saying no when someone in our community says that they need something. So without support, we inevitably give way too much of ourselves, we burn out, our community babies become monsters, and then it burns out and dies. So it's important for you to find ways to contribute, however small. So I, can, I encourage everyone here after today, if this event was amazing, uh, if you go back to your communities at home, because I know a lot of us travel in from other places, think about your local user group and what you might be able to offer them. And reach out to the organizer and just check in. You know, you could suggest some things that you know that you can do. So maybe you can just help at, with check-in at the next event or buy pizza for the next meetup that you're attending. Uh, you could, um, there's a ton of options.
options. We can talk afterwards, because I just blanked what I was going to say. But <laughs> uh, if you do anything, you're making a direct investment into the future of your community and the just paying back a small portion of the benefit that you've earned over time. At the very least, if you see these amazing people at the bar, buy them a cold one, because they are good. <laughs> so I have some recommended reading in my slides. Uh, they should be uh, posted to Twitter. I, I scheduled it, so if you check my Twitter account, you'll find them. Uh, and you can read a little bit more about how to support your community. And I have some image sources here from my slides, just so that I'm not lying and pretending I 